Good morning, all. Good afternoon, all. On behalf of Lokanitha Rajaram Babu Patil, Ayurvedic Medical College, Hospital, TG and PhD Institute Research Center, Islampur. I am Dr. Sunil Wadavikar from Shalakya Tantra Department. Accordingly, welcome you all for today's national webinar on topic contact lenses and face step by step approach organized by Shalakandra. I welcome in today's guest speakers, chairpersons, faculty members, PG students, and interns. I also welcome our respected dean, Dr. Virendra Minkere, sir, PG director, Dr. Pramod Kanap, sir, PhD director, Dr. Ajit Patil, sir. And Director of Prakash Shikshan Mandal, Dr. Sandeep Yadu, sir. I also welcome and thanks to our founder of Institute, respected Sri Nishikanta Bhosle Patil Dada, for his guidance and support throughout. Now I request our respected Dean to deliver his valuable speech for this national webinar. Thank you. Welcome to one and all. Today on the occasion of the national webinar conducted by the Department of Health Center of the Institute. So at the outset, I wish today's speakers, Dr. Vishal Patel sir, Dr. Mayur Sirakar sir, for their valuable uh, information on the topic contact lens by Dr. Vishal Patel sir. And Dr. Mayur Shankar sir's topic that is endoscopic sinus surgery. So both the topics are quite interesting and uh, what are the new innovations, the work which has been carried out which will be informative for all the uh, delegates who have joined this webinar. So I would like to wish my Best to the department people for the conduction of this webinar, and I wish best of luck for the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Now I request our departmental professor, Dr. Nita Patel, Madam, to introduce our today's speaker and chairperson for this session. Good afternoon, one and all. Myself, Dr. Nita. On this occasion of webinar, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the first chair person for today's webinar. They will effectively take you up to the proceedings without further hesitation. I present Dr. Rengas Morris, sir, Vice Principal at HOD Salakya Tantra from ABPM Sinai Vedic College, Mumbai. He is a BOS member from clinical subject. And a faculty member of Ayurveda faculty from MUHS. Welcome, sir. Today, I'm feeling proud to introduce Dr. Vishal Patil, sir, as he is an alumni of our institute. He has completed his BMS from LRK Ayurvedic Medical College in 2008 and PG from Ayurved Mahavidyalaya Rahuri in 2012. He has 11 years teaching experience and now working as a HOD and associate professor in Shalakya Tantra at Ayurved Mahavidyalaya Samantawadi. He has presented many papers and se in seminars and conferences. He has published articles in newspapers and magazines. He is an active organizer for various workshops. He organized more than 200 camps in rural and uh, urban areas of Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, and Gujarat states and operated more than 2,000 surgeries, ophthalmic surgeries successfully. As a social activity, he delivered more than 100 lectures about eye care and awareness of diseases in rural areas on, and on FM radio also. 
now i request dr vishal patil to please start his lecture on contact lens can i start sir yes sir you can start okay uh, good afternoon all uh, first of all dhanvantari and namaha myself dr vishal patil ms shalakya netra working as associate and hod in the department of shalakya tantra rani janki bai vaidyakiya trust bai saheb savant ayurved mahavidyalay savantwadi uh, respected dignitaries and honorable nishikant dada patil saheb Uh, respected dean dr minkere sir respected uh, pg director and my friend dr pramod kanab sir uh, pg director dr patil sir uh, hod uh, shalakya tantra my sir dr pravin sawan sir uh, my teacher dr nita patil madam uh, dr sunil walvekar sir dr dhage madam and dr bapat madam and uh, our guide dr ravi more sir and dr virkar madam it is a very honor honor for me to deliver a lecture in front of all my mentors my teachers my mother at my mother institute uh, it's very honor uh, for me so first i thanks all uh, one and all for giving me this opportunity to express my words uh, that is contact lenses clinical function and practical op optics as all of know a refractive errors that is ametropia is a major uh, major patients of uh, this disorder are coming to the ophthalmic opd day to day uh, the refractive error means ametropia that is the refractive condition of the eye in which parallel rays coming from the distant object are not focused on the retina specifically at macula with accommodation at rest ametropia consists of myopia hypermetropia astigmatism and presbyopia uh, all all we know myopia is a refractive condition in which the distant rays coming from the uh, the parallel rays coming from the distant object are not focused over the retina they are focused in front of retina uh, so the image is uh, not clearly found and the patient has symptoms of diminished of vision distance like that hypermetropia and astigmatism are also a refractive errors many refractions of the eye occurs at corneal interface all of, all we know the diopteric power of the eyeball is 60 diopters and in which cornea is the major refractive media it uh, compromises about 40 to 44 diopters so the cornea is the major uh, factor for a refraction so in the treatment of refractive errors the cornea has very much important value so we all know the refractive errors the treatment of refractive errors are mostly spectacle lenses most common method of correcting refractive errors but the disadvantage of spectacles are too many uh, they, they are uh, hard to use they are uh, they may be lost and uh, so for the uh, development or for the quest of better looks or better vision we uh, the development of contact lenses are uh, found so a demography according to national center for biotechnology information usa the percentage of refractive error in day to day ophthalmic opd is more than 55.56% so the day to day in day to day opd ophthalmic opd more than 50% patients are of refractive errors so we should uh, give uh, attention towards refractive errors and the other management of refractive errors like contact lenses uh due to this uh, covid era the number of refractive errors are increasing day by day in asians it is about 60% uh in europeans it is about 45% uh, people are from refractive errors or in day to day ophthalmic opd in rural area it is about 53% and in urban in india it is about 81% so worldwide uh, demography states that over 2 billion people are affected by refractive error 
So in today's lecture, we are uh, going to see the new management of refractive errors with the help of contact lenses. So the contact lenses topics are uh, basic optics, its types like soft contact lenses, rigid glass permeable lenses, hybrid lenses, and lens calculations. So we first define the contact lenses as it is the artificial device which corrects the refractive error, which placed anterior surface of the cornea. So it is simply an artificial visual device having its optical power. So history of contact lenses in the quest of uh, better knowledge or better uh, vision, uh, the contact lenses are okay. derived since 1508 to till date. In 1508, Leonardo da Vinci used bowl half filled with water for treatment of uh, refractive errors. In 1637, discretes used tube filled water. And in 1887, Muller used glass shells. So the history of contact lenses suggests that the evolution of contact lens formation is from 15th, 15th century to till date. So in 1888, Tick formulated the term contact lenses first. Initially, two types are available. Two, two types were available. Uh, one is a blown glass lens from Muller. Muller has designed that uh, contact lenses, blown glass. Uh, they are too much hard and they are painful. So the new uh, glass material or the new material for contact lenses are uh, designed. In 1937, Payne Bloom first used plastic polymer for the manufacture. So in the 19th century, the uh, formation of PVC, that is polyvinyl or polymer, is uh, the technology is uh, developed. So from that era, the contact lenses are manufactured properly or with ideal material. So what should be the ideal material for contact lenses manufacturing? So first thing is it should be highly biocompatible because contact lenses are placed over the cornea and all we know cornea has richest nerve supply. So uh, it should not harmful to the cornea. It should not uh, create foreign body sensation in the eye. So the biocompatibility is the important factor for the contact lens. And it has optical property also. So it should be transparent because light rays are uh, light rays should be passed through cornea and to uh, get into the uh, get up to the macula. So the optical property is also in important. Refractive index of the contact lens is important. So the ideal material has some physical properties like wettability. It should be wettable. It should be hydrophilic in nature. It should not be become dry. It is permeable because uh, cornea has some uh, corneal nutrition is done by air also. So uh, it should be permeable, high water content, heat resistance, and it has specific gravity and scratch resistance. It should be scratch resistance for durability. It should be durable. It should be uh, wear from uh, how many days or for longer period. Now the oxygen transm uh, transmissibility is uh, is termed uh, by DK by K and uh, it is uh, found that DK, more than 30 DK uh, is uh, used for contact lenses manufacturing uh, property. Uh, so the oxygen transmissibility DK by K in which D means uh, diffusion coefficient, which is in uh, centimeter per second, and K for solubility of the gas in material, and L for thickness of the material in terms of millimeter. So it depends upon the permeability of the lens material, thickness of the lens, and temperature at which test is performed. So oxygen permeability of the lens is like low decay material below 20, uh, then the next grade is mild decay material, then it is 20 to 40, and high decay material is 40 to 60, and hyper decay material above 60. 
So oxygen permeability for daily wear, the recommended decay by T of a contact lens is around 30. So low oxygen permeability can result in corneal uh, changes uh, like corneal pathologies like corneal edema, blab, change in the corneal pH, polymagatism, formation of microcyst in cornea may hamper. So the uh, best contact lens should be uh, oxygen permeability should be around 30 decay pi T. So the wettability of the contact lens is also important. The angle that the edge of a bed of water makes with the surface of contact lens called wetting angle. The smaller the wetting angle, the greater the wettability of the lens. So more the wettability of the lens, there is the uh, easy or smooth conduction of wearing of contact lenses. So the finally ideal contact lens material should be meets corneal oxygen requirement. It should not hamper the corneal nutrition. It is physiologically inert. It should not uh, damage to the cornea or the adjacent tissue like conjunctiva. So it should be physiologically inert, most biocompatible. It should be excellent in vivo weighting. That is, it is hydrophilic in nature and it resists spoilation. Spoilation can damage the cornea and it can form the corneal inflammations. So ideal contact lens material is dimensionally stable, durable, optically transparent, uh, requires minimal patient care. It should be cost effective. The types of contact lens design are the monocore or single cut lens that is used for monofocal vision. Then bico, trico or multico, toric lens as toric back surface, they are used for the astigmatism purpose or the cylindrical purpose. Uh, Bitoric lenses are with the type of prism blast lenses and truncated lenses, lenticular lenses and bifocal lenses. These are the contact lenses designed. Uh, various types of contact lenses like monoco, bico, trico, multico. Uh, but they are not used regularly. Mostly used lenses are monocore lenses. Now the indication of contact lenses. When we prescribe contact lenses, as, uh, uh, as I told earlier that uh, more than 55%, 55.56% are of refractive errors in which only 2% uh, are using contact lenses. So the number of uh, using contact lenses is very less. So we should aware the patient. So the indication, uh, the patient best suited to contact lens is one who wants to see better without glasses. So the main indication is optical indication. Uh, that is the in cases of myopia for myopia correction or hypermetropia or astigmatism or in prisbyopia, correction, opaque condition, anisometropia, anisochoric condition, and keratoconus. In keratoconus conditions, we use hard lenses. The other one indication for contact lenses using is cosmetic indications for cosmetic effect in cases of aniridia, in cases of albinism or coloboma of iris or large iridectomy for cosmetic purpose to hide the abnormality. Heterochromia means uh, different iris colors. Uh, microcornea and microphthalmus conditions in corneal scars. When, whenever there is a big scar in the cornea to hide uh, that co uh, corneal scar or that corneal opacity, uh, we use cosmetic uh, uh, contact lenses. Inoperable cataract patients who wants to uh, hide their uh, opacity. Now the next indications for contact lenses are occupational indications uh, in uh, actors or public speakers. They don't want to use uh, spectacles for uh, their occupational purposes. So they want then we give the, or we prescribe uh, contact lenses, people using telescopes or microscopes 
there is a difficulty while using microscopes or telescope with the spectacles so we can use contact lenses in sports persons while uh, doing their job or while doing or while playing uh, their sports uh, there is a difficulty you are a difficulty for using uh, spectacles so we can give uh, contact lenses option for that sports sports persons or protection from steam spray and mist that is the occupational indications in some cases of orthokeratology absolute concept we uh, give the rigid glass permeable lenses or progressive flat fitting lenses for uh, progressive myopia or astigmatism to control uh, the changes in the cornea also we can use uh, contact lenses for diagnostic purpose uh, for treatment protocols for diagnostic use we can use in fundoscopy gonioscopy aplanation tonometry or in a scan biometry so the list of indications are more but we uh, we fail to prescribe or we are less aware of using contact lenses nowadays but uh, we should aware people to use for contact lenses more and more the contraindications are systemic disorders like diabetes oral concept oral contraceptive pills pregnancy and perimenopausal symptoms or perimenopausal conditions allergic like contact dermatitis asthma atrophic rhinitis also occupational in some occupational hazards conditions uh, we don't prescribe contact lenses like smoky dusty hot environment chemical fumes or irritant environments which irritates the cornea or contact lenses high altitude flyers or construction worker uh there is a uh, majority of chances of uh, ocular trauma or automobile mechanisms we uh, don't give at that time or the uh, contraindicated in that people uh, other contraindications are poor general health clumsy patients lower socio economic status or lower hygienic conditions old patients with low motivation or arthritis arthritis patients or in uh, generalized debilitated patient so the advantages of contact lenses are very more like no peripheral abrasion the peripheral abrasion may found in uh, spectacles no chromatic abrasions prism distortions can be controlled uh, less magnification or magnification uh, is the advantage astigmatism can be controlled by using uh, hard contact lenses no fogging uh in rainy season we all know with the help of, uh, with spectacles when whenever we go for outing and if there is a heavy rainfall we can't see anything uh so fogging due to fogging uh increased field of vision uh because the contact lenses are fitted over the cornea so the field of vision is increased in the uh contact lenses and also cosmetically more pleasant as compared to spectacles so the classification according to the mode of wear of contact lenses uh, we can use daily wear means we can uh, use uh, contact lenses in daily wear basis or extended wear basis or disposable it can be found uh, daily disposable monthly disposable or uh, quarterly disposable so uh, so the purpose of use is for optical purpose for refraction treatment of refraction therapeutic and cosmetic now the classification of contact lenses according to the anatomical position means uh, the contact lenses are based or placed over the sclera that is called scleral contact lens some contact lenses are placed just over the sclera that is semi scleral contact lens and purely over the cornea that is called as corneal contact lenses so the nature of lens material it can be of rigid non gas permeable or hard contact lenses that is pmma that is polymethyl hydroxy acetate or rigid ga gas permeable or semi soft contact lenses or soft contact lenses that is hema material hard contact lenses or rigid non gas permeable lenses made up of 
PMMA, uh, which conforms to the cornea, the advantage is they have uh, they have light in weight, high optical quality, non toxic, and easy to manufacture. But PMMA lenses are hard lenses, so it can cause injury to the cornea if they are not properly used. So this advantage of PMMA or rigid non-gas permeable lenses is low wettability, low O2 permeability, that is decay value, and uh, it is hard and now absolute because we are not using hard contact lenses due to their complications or disadvantages. Uh, rigid gas permeable lenses or semi-soft lenses initially made up of cellulose acetate. After that, the silicon acrylates are used for the manufacturing of the semi-soft lenses. Uh, it is the copolymer of PMMA and silicon containing uh, polymer uh, or stearine formation or fluoropolymers for extended wears. Its size usually 9 to 10 uh, millimeter in diameter. Uh, based in high myopes or astigmatism more than two diopters and in keratoconus conditions. Now we uh, difference between the soft contact lenses with high water content and low water content. High water content are more advantageous because it has higher decay value. It is more flexible and faster restoration of the shape following deformation because they are very soft in nature. Uh, it's disadvantage due to they are very soft. They are also more fragile. It has more uh, prone for deposition or spoilage. Uh, they are also difficult to manufacture because uh, the manufacturing cost and manufacturing process is very difficult. It has lower tensile strength and cannot be made too thin. The soft lenses with high water content and the soft lenses with low water content uh, the advantages are less susceptible to environmental changes, low protein deposition, ease of manufacturing. They are more weightable and compatible with the all lens care products. Disadvantages are it has low decay value, less flexible and thin lens difficult to handle for the patient. So advantages of soft contact lenses are it is are very compatible, easy to adapt. It is larger and adhered more tightly to the cornea. It has no spectacle blur and doesn't correct uh, because they are very in soft nature. It doesn't correct astigmatism because it uh, it, it is impossible for them to convert the uh, corneal curvature. But in uh, rigid lenses, we get some better quality of vision. It are more durable. It corrects astigmatism due to its rigidity. It, uh, because they are uh, high weightable, so it has deposit resistance, less chance of infection, and it is its cost of lens, and uh, cost cost of lens is very uh, less as compared to soft contact lenses. They are comfortable and tough. Now to uh, tackle these disadvantages of soft lenses and hard contact lenses. New hybrid lenses are designed in which the central optical zone is formed by the rigid gas permeable lenses and surrounded by the peripheral soft contact lens material. This, these are also called as second generation silicon hydrogel contact lenses called by Duet having a highly oxygen permeability, permeability gas permeable center and surrounded by the soft silicon for the comfort of the patient. So the wear and replacement schedule is also important. We should not use extended wear of contact lenses uh, because they can harmful to the corneal uh, nutrition and they can harmful to the corneal surface. Uh, daily wear contact lenses, we can use traditional replacement cycle more than three months. We can use monthly replacement uh, or daily replacement. But uh, I suggest to use conventional contact lenses or prescribe conventional contact lenses because they are uh, used for uh, at least one year. And if the patient is taken proper care of contact lens and proper using contact lens care solutions, 
then it should it may it can uh, it may uh, he may use it for uh, one and a half year also so extended wear uh, contact lenses allowing lenses to be worn for seven days or, or six nights without removal during one night per week the eyes are free of lenses weekly replaced by new lenses in this condition we have to replace uh, weekly uh, the flexible wear uh, comprises between the daily wear and extended wear depending upon the demand of the patient to once uh, while sleep with the lenses these are the some images of hybrid contact lenses central part is hard which is made up of rigid glass permeable and uh, uh, peripheral part is soft uh, rgp lenses plus soft lenses also known as hybrid lenses these are also called as on in uh, all in one lenses these are the some terminology used for contact lenses uh, like back optical zone radius uh, contact lenses fitting is important uh, pre for contact lenses fitting we should uh, pre fit consultation for complete history uh, of the patient because in diabetic patients or in asthmatic patients or in uh, uh, pregnant uh, patient we can not prescribe uh, contact lenses so complete history detailed eye examination uh, some infectious conditions of cornea conjunctiva pterygium like conditions uh, uh, or in dacrocystitic conditions uh, we suggest to stop the contact lenses so detailed eye examination is important keratometric reading is important for the calculation of the base curve uh, that is mean uh, corneal reading is required in terms of mm a horizontal plus vertical divided by 2 that is mean k is required in terms of uh, millimeter for base curve calculation corneal diameter is measured and radius of curvature is measured with the help of keratometer in terms of uh, diopters and in terms of millimeter also so keratometric method uh, for base curve cal calculation uh, the base curve is the back surface of the lens and it is important uh, for in cases of microcornea or uh, megalocornea like conditions but nowadays uh, the standard base curve uh, of uh, 8.4 or 8.3 uh, are used for the manufacturing of the contact lenses so keratometric readings or the base curve calculation is the older method so the base curve that is the rest on cornea is responsible for good fit long radius of curvature uh, if if there is a long radius of curvature then flatter base curve uh, will form uh, so optical zone should be at least 7 mm which is central one and the posterior surface of the uh, contact lens is a spheric and anterior surface is convex with the uh, power the fact, uh, first factors to be keep in mind the total diameter should 1 to 1.5 uh, greater than the hvid that is it should be greater than the corneal surface determination of lens power is uh, uh, determined by spherical power of the uh, refraction and, and plus if there is a cylindrical power and if it is below than 0.5 diopters then we uh, reject uh, that cylindrical power and if uh, or we drop that cylindrical power if cylindrical power is more than 2 diopters then we go for toric contact lenses so the contact lens should be tightly fit it should not move uh, around with the movement of eyeball so uh, for the sign of tight fit lens coverage is important which should be uh, uniform and the movement of lens should be less than 0.5 mm uh, when fluctuating uh, fluctuating vision clears on the blinking or the progressive discomfort for the wearing uh, age is uh, indentation of limbus and retinoscopic image is fiji for the sign of uh, proper uh, contact lens fitting uh, after fitting half hour to one hour should be given for subside reflex lacrimation because uh, cornea has rich nerve supply and we put a foreign body in the form of contact lens over the cornea so initially uh, hyper lacrimation or a reflex lacrimation is more but uh, uh, during the uh, time it should uh, total pupillary capture should be 
important and the movement of the lens opposite to the movement of the eye uh, on blinking lens should not move upward because uh, it should be fixed over the cornea so uh, first we do a schematic flow chart for the soft contact lens fitting uh, we should use insert trial frame and give uh, patient refraction after confirming refraction uh, the trial lenses are used uh, for uh, fitting but nowadays we don't use trial lenses or trial set lenses we uh, prescribe uh, contact lenses directly uh, according to their refraction status refractive status and after uh, giving order to the lens companies we purchase that uh, contact lenses and we give uh, contact lens fitting training proper contact lens fitting training to the patients uh, before that we do slit lamp examination for corneal curvature uh, coverage uh, if cornea is healthy or not corneal thickness corneal uh, uh, integrity uh, in the form if there is any corneal abrasion or not Uh, corneal edema or not uh, centration corneal uh, keratometric readings all are assessed uh, assessment before the initial fit vision assessment visual acuity and over refraction is over refraction if not or for the base score calculation um, we use uh, keratometric reading in the form of uh, millimeter so the definition of base curve of a lens is the surface of curve that serves as the basis or the starting point from which the remaining curve will be calculated that is the base curve which rests over the anterior corneal surface so the selection of base curve is made when the lens is the semi finished state in which case the base curve is always on the finished side of the lens so we have uh, two uh, formulas one is vogel's formula and other one is manufacturer table with that uh, vogel's formula and manufacturer tables we uh, derive the exact power of the lens and we uh, prescribe them like that so the next point is uh, types of cosmetic lenses the other one is uh, iris painted lenses with clear pupil for albinatic uh, lenses or black pupil pupil with iris painted or pupil painted this is for only cosmetic effect and the disadvantages are toxic effect and corneal edema uh, the cosmetic contact lenses are uh, found in various colors or the manufactured with various colors like blue brown green honey or gray Uh, the new contact lenses uh, types are contact lenses for color blindness uh, people uh, using customized fitters to change the wavelength of each color so they are used for the treatment in the blindness but this is in the research step uh, the x chrome lens and golden yellow lenses are also now in uh, 2014 uh, google contact lens is a smart contact lens pro project announced by the google on 16th january 2014 the project aims to assist people with the diabetes by constantly measuring the glucose level in their tears so these are the newer lenses or newer design lens contact lenses which are mm, used by the diabetic patients also some in some conditions like keratophikia epikeratophikia or keratomeliasis or uh, epikeratophikia and keratophikia uh, high power lenses implanted inside the corneal stroma uh, or epikeratophikia high power lens is implanted in the corneal epithelium so the keratomeliasis in situ we all know uh, with ass laser assisted that is lasik hyperosmotic the newer hyperosmotic contact lenses are also uh, newer contact lenses with optical performance is diminished because the shape and size of the epithelial cell uh, changed to close the gap created by the destroyed cells so the hyperosmotic contact lenses acts as a therapeutic soft contact lenses with unique capability of the increasing drops contact time 
uh, it improves the vision which facilitate corneal healing they are also used as a in the form of bandage contact lenses and also proven uh, to relieve the corneal edema hyper contact lenses are in and it enables the extraction of the fluid from the corneal stroma and combined with the increased evaporation over the lens surface it is disposable and reusable up to 2 weeks the dual base curve combined with the groove and the holes inside the lens creates the micro environment above the center of cornea and that holds fluid with high ionic concentration and thereby absorption is more this is the design of hyper contact lenses operational principle is the application of hyperosmotic drops results in the extraction of fluids from the cornea reducing the corneal edema indications that is the therapeutic use in the acute and chronic ocular pathologies such as corneal erosions entropion corneal edema and corneal dystrophies in post surgical conditions resulting from cataract extraction or corneal surgeries it may be used it can provide optical correction during the healing process if required contraindication any eye disease injury or abnormality that affects the cornea or conjunctiva or the eyelids or the dry eye disease in these conditions uh, the hyper contact lenses are contraindicated any systemic disease which ex exaggerated by the wearing contact lenses patients unable to follow lens care regimen or unable to obtain assistance to do so allergic lens material allergic to the lens material which are used for so the contact lens tips we should uh, suggest the patient uh, make sure your contact lenses are in or not or inside out in that uh, contact lens solution how to check or the uh, so the uh, companies uh, which uh, mainly manufactured the contact lens solutions are bosch and lom alcon amo the development and delivery of the contact lens education by iacle is supported through the educational grants or in kinds of contributions uh, these are the some uh, international manufacturers so the contact lens care products are also important because uh, the care and maintenance of the contact lenses is very much important uh, because we prescribe contact lenses for uh, yearly conventional uh, contact lenses. So the clean cleaning of contact lenses uh, and uh, their maintenance is important for the uh, contact lenses hydration and wettability. When men, uh, we maintain a contact lens hydration and wettability in proper way, so the comfort and vision increases. And uh, there are the less chances of dis uh, less chances of infection and inflammation. For the prevention of ocular infection, uh, we have to uh, suggest patients for proper caring of contact lenses. The complication of contact lens solutions are depositions. Uh, so the deposits are uh, products. Uh, from the uh, contact lens solutions uh, where the deposits over the surface of contact lenses and in turns they irritate the cornea so the comfort of uh, uh, wearing contact lenses decreases that's why visual acuity and corneal edema decreases and also the life of the contact lenses is decreases so the deposits is the main uh, issue of contact lens uh, uh, care So the care and maintenance uh, of the contact lenses is important for uh, we should uh, try cleaning properly, rinsing the uh, contact lens in properly or disinfect with the uh, contact lens solutions. Periodical protein removal, uh, these are the additional steps or re-wetting or lubricating uh, the lenses or care and the replacement of contact lenses is important. This is the image of lens spoilage and due to that lens spoilage, the optical property of the contact lenses decreases and so the vision may decrease so uh, some contact lenses product and their uh, content 
is uh, uh, here uh, common excipients uh, are sodium chloride edta hpmc hydroxy ethyl cellulose they can uh, damage the contact lenses uh, when we cannot uh, took proper care so the new research or new uh, at a new development in the co uh, contact lenses is the Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vishal Patil, sir, for your valuable speech to this webinar. Now, now I would like to request Dr. Ravidas More, sir, to share his views about this session. Hello. 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 Ah, sir, uh, you are audible. You can uh, share your screen. Yes. First of all, uh, I congratulate the Shalapet and the Department of uh, Ayurvedic College Islampur for organizing such nice uh, webinar and uh, selecting uh, such nice uh, topic for PG and PG students. Vaivikar uh, sir, Nita madam, and Madhura madam, and all the concerned. Uh, teachers and the students of this department, specifically the dean of the college and the PG director, all uh, congratulations to all these faculty, specifically. Uh, I think uh, this uh, practice was routine in uh, during the uh, corona period. And nowadays, now it is uh, this college, your college has organizing this. So, thank you, and uh, I congratulate the of myself for this. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Vishal sir, Vishal Patil sir, for delivering such a nice lecture. This lecture was informative, knowledgeable for all these uh, PG and UG students and all uh, faculties also. And this is nowadays it is a routine practice uh, for wearing these uh, contact lenses. What is what is to choose whether it is contact lens or glasses? Now, many patients and even though educated people also they are in uh, in uh, in a dilemma. Some some educated people also they want to wear these contact lenses in spite of these glasses because the disadvantages of these spectacles and uh, some over advantages of the contact lenses. So this is informative lecture, knowledgeable lecture, which is near of an hour today for our society to change this view of these uh, spectacles. And more and more knowledge and information should be spread among the people also in the society also to uh, take the advantage of this uh, type of new technique or new advantages in this uh, contact lecture. Uh, in spite of that, uh, I want to add one thing that uh, in our science, can we do some solution for this, uh, in spite of these uh, contact lenses and uh, uh, glasses, uh, spectacle also? This is a question in, uh, in front of us uh, among all these faculties. We have to think over this. 
is there any solution can we provide anything uh, or, or can we add something to replace these glasses or the contact lenses by our own ways research should be awaited research should be on this topic i think and when such a uh, solution will be there then this is uh, can say uh, golden golden that will be the golden hour for uh, faculty of science so thank you very much uh, vishal patil sir for giving such nice lecture thanks for inviting me for this uh, occasion thank you over to over to walaker sir yes thank you thank you ravidas more sir for your valuable comments for this first session uh, first interesting session mm -hmm. uh, now i request dr madhura gopat madam for vote of thanks for this first session mm -hmm. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Madhura Bapat, Assistant Professor at LRT AMC. I am pleased to be standing here on behalf of our institute to uh, convey my vote of thanks to our today's eminent speaker, Dr. Vishal Patil sir. Sir, uh, thankful, very thankful to your uh, valuable speech. Um, uh, and sir, uh, the lecture is very informative and deeply uh, incited lecture on the topic contact lenses. And I'm grateful to the esteemed uh, delegates of our webinar for their presence and efforts uh, to making this session successful. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Robert, madam. Now I request our, our departmental assistant professor, Dr. Dagya, madam, to introduce our uh, next speaker. Dr. Mayur Sharada, please. Thank you, sir, for giving me uh, giving me the, uh, this opportunity to introduce our today's guest. Uh, good afternoon to all. I, Dr. Varsha Dugge, Assistant Professor, Department of Shalakti Tantra, would like to introduce our today's care person for the next session. Uh, respected Dr. Chandana Abhay Mirzal, Madam. Madam has done her PG in MS Shalakya Tantra and uh, also postgraduate diploma in Netra Rho from Pune University. She is the uh, HOD and professor at College of IMA and Research Center, Akudi Pune. She has a total experience of 25 years in academics. Uh, she is the approved uh, UG and PG teacher, PhD guide, examiner, moderator, paper setter. She, is, she has participated in many international, national seminars, reorientation program. She also presented uh, many research papers in national and international peer review journals. She, uh, she also uh, uh, organized and actively participated in many eye camps, uh, eye checkup camps and screen surgery also, which, uh, which is uh, involved in Limca Book of Records. Uh, so I welcome to respect Dr. Chandana Vizal, Madam as chairperson in today's national webinar. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, now, moving ahead, I would like to talk about uh, the second uh, speaker for this session, uh, my mentor, uh, respected Dr. Mayur Shirayasar, sir, uh, who accepted our invitation as a speaker in a very short notice of time. Uh, sir has uh, done his uh, MS in Shalakya Center with ENT specialization from Raju Gandhi University. Bangalore. Uh, he is currently working as a professor HOD in the uh, Department of Shalakya Tantra, uh, also a medical superintendent in Dr. Dimai Patil Ayurveda Hospital, Tempri. Uh, he also, uh, he is working as an ENT surgeon and consultant in Shirakar Hospital, Pune. Uh, sir has a vast experience in performing various ENT surgeries like tonsillectomy, septoplastic, uh, DCR, and face. Sir has published many uh, research articles related with the uh, ENT uh, diseases in national and international peer review journals. Uh, 
uh, as a shalaki uh, today i'm feeling very proud to say that sir has always been there for with us uh, with task since many years uh, he has worked as a secretary of task maharashtra state board uh, uh, state uh, branch from uh, 2013 to 2015 uh, sir has organized the indonesian cannabis dissection workshop and cme in dr d y patil ayurved medical college pune Sir has also worked as a chief editor of uh, Task Central. Uh, sir uh, worked as a demonstrator in cadaveric uh, endolaser DCT surgeries in Update Shalakya Tantra conference, uh, which, is held, uh, which was held in the uh, Ayurved College in 2019. Uh, today's topic is very interesting and is about all uh, advanced endoscopic sinus uh, surgeries techniques, which will surely uh, going to boost your confidence and uh, dedication towards ENT practice. Uh, so I request uh, Dr. Shiraka, sir, to start with your presentation. Sir, over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Varsha, for such a nice introduction. Uh, I'd like to share my screen now. OK. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, I think my slides are visible to everyone. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. yes. Uh, so, yes, uh, today we are going to talk about uh, FES, uh, that is uh, endoscopic sinus surgery. Uh, this, I think, a few years back, when uh, I used to give lectures on uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, uh, in that era, you know, many many people they even didn't know how a scope used to look. Uh, thankfully, now everybody knows how a scope looks, uh, what is the functionality of a scope, and how it is useful in our day to day practice. Uh, I usually encourage everyone and even my students that uh, get a scope, put it in, uh, inside the nose, in, inside the ear, and try to see, visualize all the structures which are present over there. Nevertheless, uh, moving forward, uh, uh, yeah, going to the uh, history of FES. See, uh, in way back in 1903, Hirschman had published a first article on endoscopy of nose and its accessory sinuses. Since that day, uh, in 1980, 1985, where uh, John Hopkins uh, Medical Center uh, introduced a first course in FES. Uh, which means that see, it's not it's not a very old uh, uh, what we can say technique that uh, is there into the market. It's, it's just from 1985, around four to five decades from now. So it's pretty new, uh, known to the uh, medical fraternity that how uh, face uh, surgeries work out. Uh, the concept of face is very simple. See, any any surgery with, that we do uh, on humans, the concept is very simple that we try to uh, preserve the na natural body or natural uh, mucosa of uh, the body and whatever uh, is the pathological part we try to remove only that part so uh, with face surgery or endoscopic uh, sinus surgery that is very uh, possible for us to you know just uh, tackle the pathological part and uh, preserve the rest of the nasal mucosa i think now we everybody knows uh, know how a sinuscope looks uh, it has got, uh, you, you get a 0 degree scope, 30 degree scope, 45 degree scope, 70 degree scope, 90 degree scope. Uh, it is very simple. A 0 degree scope is a scope which, you know, when, when you look from this eyepiece, uh, you can look straight ahead. Uh, and that is, that that uh, that doesn't deviate from the horizontal axis. So that's a 0 degree endoscope. A 30 degree endoscope, it makes an angle of 30 degree with the horizontal. So you, if you see the picture down over here, the, the scope uh, at its proximal end is, you know, it's cut uh, at an angle of 30 degree. So when you look over here, you are not looking straight ahead, but rather you are looking 30 degrees up above. Similarly, it goes for 45 degrees, 70 degree and 90 degrees. See, all these uh, degrees of endoscopes are necessary for us to visualize various other structures in the nose, which is not possible for us to look by a zero degree endoscope. Of course, yes, 80% uh, of our job is done with the help of a zero degree endoscope. But if you do have a 30 degree or a 45 degree or a 70 degree endoscope, it is going to make your uh, work a bit easier. Um, 
And the indications uh, for face surgery, I think we all know now, a chronic uh, sinusitis, which is not responding to a routine line of uh, medical treatment, uh, is indicated for face recurrent sinusitis. Is, meaning uh, if the patient is coming to our OPD and recurrently he is complaining of uh, sinusitis, yes, we can post that patient for uh, face surgery. Uh, nasal polyposis, which includes uh, ethmoidal as well as antroconal polyps, yes, uh, we have to remove that. We have to clear the passages uh, of the sinuses. Sinus mucosils, where uh, this is a bit uh, debatable part because many a times mucosils, you know, they are, uh, uh, it, it is, a patient doesn't have any complaints about it. So it can remain uh, as it is usually present at the floor of the maxillary sinus. But yes, if the, it is there, if it's causing any uh, problems, yes, uh, that is one more indication why you can uh, get a face surgery done. Excision of tumors, yes, because if we are near the skull base, so any tumors that are arranging near the skull base, that can be removed with the help uh, of endoscopes. CSF leak, yes. Orbital decompression, uh, Graves disease, see, uh, many a times uh, there is proptosis present. So yes, uh, if we need uh, to, uh, uh, make sedations on the lamina papyracea and uh, decompress the orbital fat, wherein helping to uh, decompress the, uh, the orbit. Uh, optic nerve decompression. DCR, yes, but rather it's endonasal DCR, which I usually, uh, I am of the say, in, even in my department, I usually say that uh, there's no point in posting each and every patient for uh, external DCT or uh, external DCR. Endonasal DCR uh, is uh, a very important and very nice technique by which there is no scar present uh, on the patient's face. And uh, yes, uh, you get excellent results by doing endonasal DCRs as well. Coronal latresia, foreign body removal. Yes, uh, endoscopes play a very vital role. If it goes more posteriorly, you uh, under a general anesthesia, you can remove with the help of uh, endoscopes. Epistaxis control, yes, uh, uh, not anterior, uh, mostly posterior uh, epistaxis. Uh, if it's coming from the Woodrow's plexus or the sphenopalatine artery, it helps us to control with the help of uh, endoscopes. Uh, now, these are a few important structures that we all have to remember, you know, while doing uh, a face surgery. Uh, the nasal septum, the three turbinates, superior, middle, and inferior turbinate, the uncinate process, the natural maxillary ostium, ethmoidal bulla. Uh, ethmoid sinuses, which includes anterior and posterior ethmoid sinuses, sphenoid sinus, frontal recess, lamina papyracea, and the ethmoidal arteries. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about a few important parts that we need to keep a watch uh, while doing a face surgery, uh, which will help you to avoid creating any problems while operating on a live patient. Uh, this is how uh, you get an endoscopic view of uh, the nasal uh, cavity. Uh, you see this, this is a middle turbinate and the place where it is attached, this is the lateral wall of the nose. The septum obviously is on the, uh, on the medial side, the lateral side of the nose where the middle turbinate is attached to the lateral wall. And uh, you can see uh, axilla written over here. Now axilla is a very important part and a very important uh, structure while uh, doing a face surgery. Uh, it, uh, the name is given simply because as, as our arm is attached to our body, similarly, the middle turbinate is attached to the lateral wall uh, at, at this juncture and hence it's called as axilla. The important uh, uh, point is that this is the place where agar nasal cells are present and uh, we, I'll, be, I'll be talking about agar nasal cells in a, in a short while. Uh, but this is also a place where we usually start infiltrating while uh, starting a face surgery. So uh, anytime, whenever we are going for a face surgery, the first thing is that, yes, we have to try to uh, identify where the axilla is there. Once you under identify the axilla, then you can go ahead with the further uh, surgery. This is again a, 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 a similar slide as it was previously, but uh, the important landmark uh, is that you have to concentrate on the middle turbinate and not the superior and uh, inferior turbinate, but the middle turbinate uh, and the middle meatus is the place where we are going to work our maximum uh, surgical, surgical part and hence middle turbinate, axilla as I've just discussed, the uncinate process, I'll be talking about that, uh, the bulla ethmodalis, ethmodal acids, as I said, anterior and posterior ethmodal cells, lamina papyracea, ethmodal arteries, anterior, middle and posterior ethmodal arteries, the ground lamella, uh, sphenoid sinus and the maxillary sinus. Now we'll be talking uh, in short about a few important structures and the first one obviously is the uncinate process. See now you can see this is the middle turbinate over here. 
And you can see this, this structure, a leaf-like structure, which is present, and that is called as an unsynect process. See, if you want to do a face surgery, this is the first thing that you have to remove. Okay, so the unsynect process is a very an important landmark, and it is necessary for anyone uh, while starting a face surgery. As I said, we need to identify the um, axilla. Similarly, we have to identify the unsynect process as well. So it's a leaf-like uh, projection, which usually covers the bulla ethmodalis. It covers the maxillary sinus, and it's a gateway towards the uh, further uh, sinuses to, to uh, that we need to explore. Uh, now, this uh, structure uh, has comprised of three layers, and I'll be showing it to you in a short while, uh, that com comprises three layers, mucosa, bone, and mucosa. So the mucosa, mucosa layer is present, there is bone in between, and there is again mucosa present. So uh, there is a thin bone which is present between the two mucosal layers. I'll be showing it to you in, in a short while. Uh, the next are the ethmoidal air cells. Uh, you'll be coming across a lot of these, you know, uh, when, when you look to at any scans or anything, uh, you'll, you'll come across uh, these uh, headings that uh, there are agonizer cells, as I just, just described, hellar cells, frontoethmoidal cells, suprabullar cells, or onodi cells. See, all these cells are part of ethmoidal air cells. Okay? And it has got its own importance, uh, uh, as I'll be just telling you in a short while, but it has got its own importance. And we need to know these uh, the important cells because there are important structures that are attached with these cells. Uh, I won't be discussing more uh, much about the uh, frontal or uh, the suprabullar cells because, uh, see, that is a part which is present near the uh, frontal recess. And uh, to be very honest, uh, while doing a face surgery, it is not possible for us to uh, look into the frontal sinus. Uh, we just work on the frontal recess. We try to clear the passage over there so that the frontal sinus, it starts draining into the middle uh, meatus. But nevertheless, the name itself suggests, see the frontal bullar cell. See now, uh, what is a bulla? Bulla is nothing but uh, it is a part of uh, uh, the anatomical part of the nose where the anterior air cells, its model air cells, they come together. So the uh, frontal bullar uh, cells are just present in front of the bulla. Supraorbital is uh, the one which is present uh, above the orbit. So supraorbital ethmoidal cells. So uh, the name itself suggests that what kind of air cells uh, they are. But of course, we are not going to discuss much about these uh, air cells. The main uh, important air cells are the agar nasi, hyalur cells, and the onodi cells. Now agar nasi cell. Uh, as I just said, see, it is the anterior most ethmoidal air cell. You can see it over here. And, and so, hence, uh, it, it protrudes out at uh, the junction of the axilla, the place which I had just shown to you all of you. Uh, that is the place where uh, the agar nasi cells are there. Uh, it has got its own importance because it is directly connected to the nasal lacrimal duct. And of course, it has got its extensions to the orbit as well. And hence, uh, if there is a enlarged agar nasal cell, while operating, we should be very sure we, uh, sure that we are not disrupting or we are not trying to injure the agar nasal cell to such an extent that uh, the orbit will come into the picture or the nasal lacrimal duct will get injured by that process. Uh, Haller cells. See, you can see this cell over here. Uh, so it is present on the medial uh, uh, inferior wall of the orbit. You see, it is it is a cell which is actually creating or it is coming in between the uh, drainage passage of the maxillary sinus. So this is a maxillary sinus and it is draining into the middle meatus again. But this is the Haller cell that many times, you know, if it is increased or uh, the size is more, then many times it creates an obstruction to the passage and hence patient does come to you complaining of recurrent maxillary sinusitis. And uh, we need to open up this air cell so that the drainage is increased. The onodi cells. Uh, now, onodi cells are the cells which are just present uh, uh, before the main sphenoid sinus. Uh, the important, the importance of this, these cells are because it has got its proximity towards the uh, optic nerve and the uh, internal carotid artery. Nevertheless, even uh, the sphenoid sinus has got its own uh, uh, junction, or it has, it has got its proximity towards the. Uh, optic nerve and the uh, carotid artery. But uh, uh, many a times when onodi cells are there, uh, there is a n number of possibility that the carotid artery might be a bit uh, anterior than what we do expect. So onod knowing, uh, having a proper knowledge of onodi cells is important. Now, lamina papyracea. <clears throat> See, as the nerve itself, uh, as the na uh, name itself suggests, uh, it is paper-like uh, uh, structure. 
So it's a thin paper-like structure, which usually, you know, it covers the anterior ethmoidal air cells as well as the posterior ethmoidal air cells. So it is a bridge between the orbit and the uh, nasal cavity. And uh, it, you can clearly see a demarked dotted line over here. Many a times, this lamina papyracea can be dehiscent also. So this should be kept in our mind. Many a times, it, it can be dehiscent. If it is dehiscent, many a times, the structures of the orbits, you know, they protrude uh, into the nasal cavity. And hence, uh, knowing the lamina papyracea, whether it is intact or not on a scan is very important. Now, coming to the vessels. Uh, now, see, there are three important vessels that we usually encounter while doing a pest surgery. Okay? And uh, uh, we should be aware about these uh, vessels and where they are located. If we avoid going near these vessels, there are very less chances that you will encounter a lot of bleeding while doing a surgery. Uh, the biggest amongst the three are the anterior modal artery. It's, it's one of the biggest vessels. And it is one of the most commonly ruptured vessel. And believe me, if you rupture this vessel, uh, it starts bleeding like hell. It becomes very difficult for you to control that bleeding. Uh, the position of this uh, uh, vessel and uh, anterior modal air cell is just uh, near the ground lamella. Where the ground lamella touches the, the roof, it is just around 2 millimeters before or after it or along, even on the level of the ground lamella. What is the ground lamella? We will be talking about that. But uh, that is a place where the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery is there. And that is the artery that we usually many a times we do encounter while doing a vest surgery. On a scan, if you go to see, you will see a beak-like projection. And a beak-like projection, wherever you see that, that's the part where the uh, uh, anterior ethmoidal artery is present. The middle ethmoidal artery. <clears throat> Uh, when the middle ethmoidal artery, uh, many, many uh, authors, they do not even consider this as a vessel because it's not a, uh, you won't be able to see point number one in each and every person, this vessel to be present. Or even if you go to see, uh, it is it is not present at a particular uh, level also. The, the level at which it is present, it variates uh, from uh, patient to patient. So many times it is considered as an accessory vessel. Okay, but um, yes, middle ethmoidal artery, rarely we, we do encounter it, but we have to keep in mind that yes, middle ethmoidal artery is also present. See over here, you can you can properly see all the three arteries, see the uh, anterior ethmoidal artery, see how big it is. It's a huge artery. Okay, this is the middle ethmoidal and this is a posterior ethmoidal. Of course, see this, the position, as I said, of middle ethmoidal is very random. You can never know. It is neither present uh, at the center. It can be present near the anterior ethmoidal artery. It can be present near the posterior ethmoidal artery. It cannot be present also. So many a times, middle ethmoidal artery is a big uh, debatable point whether we have to consider it as a uh, middle ethmoidal artery or not. Nevertheless, the posterior ethmoidal artery, yes, you do come across posterior ethmoidal artery and that has to be kept in mind uh, where it lies. Uh, uh, this this is an artery which usually it, it supplies the septum of uh, the nose and uh, uh, hence when we reach near the sphenoid sinus that is a place where we usually encounter the uh, posterior ethmoidal artery it is just before the sphenoid sinus that we do encounter I'll be telling up talking about that in a short while but you can see lamina papyracea also okay so this is a thin bone like structure you know many times you see it as a yellowish bone like a, a thin film like structure which is present on uh, the lateral wall of the nose and just behind that is the orbit so you know while uh, doing a, a orbital decompression this is a place where we usually give serrations crisscross serrations is, is given over here and there is a pressure which is applied on the orbit so that the fat, you know, it starts protruding inside into the nasal cavity and hence the, uh, the pressure over the orbit, it starts going down. So that is the reason why you should know why, uh, uh, where the lamina papyracea is present. Now ground lamella. Now this is again an important part that we have to keep in mind. Ground lamella is nothing but it's a, a extension of the middle turbinate. Okay, see the middle turbinate from anteriorly, posteriorly when it goes from anterior to posterior, Posteriorly, it turns and it, it goes and attaches to the lateral uh, wall of the nose. And that is the part of that part of the turbinate which uh, attaches uh, to the lateral wall of the nose is called as ground lamina. Now, that is a part which divides the anterior ethmoids to the posterior ethmoids also. Which means that if you have to enter the posterior ethmoids, you have to break open the ground lamella. If you don't break open the ground lamella, you cannot enter the posterior ethmoids. Even in this picture, if you see, see this is the middle turbinate over here. 
you see its extension see it's going up and there it goes and attaches right so this is where the anterior ethmoids are there this is where the posterior ethmoid is there so from the entry ethmoids if i have to go to the posterior ethmoids i have to go through the ground lamella ground lamella is also important because it helps to stabilize the middle turbinate as well okay so nevertheless <clears throat> the knowledge of ground lamella is very necessary uh, we need to know from where it comes and where it gets inserted now these are the steps okay uh, that we usually do while while doing a face surgery uh the first step as i've just mentioned a few minute uh, moments ago the first step yes is uncinectomy or which is also called as an infundibulotomy but uncinectomy then uh, the maxillary sinus antrostomy is there and the ethmoidectomy is there perforation of the basal lamella as i just mentioned right now then posterior ethmoidectomy sinoid sinus exploration skull base disease clearance and at the end lastly the frontal recess exploration now to start with when we are we are coming to the main part which we are we are going to discuss uh, about uh, in today's presentation so the steps that are involved the first and foremost uh, thing that is done is that the nose is usually packed with a uh, 4% uh, xylocaine and adrenaline and uh, after that uh, uh, after 10 to 15 minutes after that then the uh, the local infiltration is done and it is done at the axilla as i have just mentioned i told you the place where it we do infiltrate it to a level where it, it starts blanching and a part of the uncinate process also blanches along with them uh, along with it many a times yes we do uh, infiltrate the middle turbinate also because we uh, that is the area where we are going to work so uh, these are the two places where we usually infiltrate and then the first step uh, is done that is the removal of the uncinate process now uh, you can you can see uh, how the uh, unsaid process is uh, uh, removed um, as i as i said that it is a leaf like projection it's a uh, leaf like uh, uh, structure which covers the bullae ethmoidales and there are various methods by which you know you can remove the unsaid process um, the most common and the most uh, uh, significant way of doing it is first you need to identify this free end of the unsaid process so which means that you have to just take this uh, middle turbinate slightly uh, medially and then try to find out this free edge you know when you when you when you give pressure on the free edge it it indents inside and you get to know that that's the free edge of it and then usually 2 to 3 mm behind it the first incision is taken now taking this incision is also very important uh, you are not supposed to go laterally usually it is said that when you take an incision uh, over here uh, you need to go around 2 to 3 mm go inside and then you need to turn the sickle towards the lateral wall okay because if you go straight inside there is a possibility that you will enter the orbit so we don't want to do that right so we just go around 2 to 3 mm inside and we turn the scalpel uh, or a sickle uh, towards the lateral wall and then we go on incising the uh, unsaid process so once we incise it downwards then the sickle is removed and then uh, again we go upwards and later on this is removed with the help of uh, straight blackes leaf i'll be showing it to you right now but <clears throat> this is one way and this is this is one of the most uh, uh, common way or, or uh, uh, one of the way which many of the ents they do uh, start uh, do in their uh, surgical practice yes you can use a backbiting uh, for sep also to remove it in any way you can use a debrider also anyhow any ways you have to remove this unsaid process if you want to go ahead as i said that this is a dwarpal unless and until you remove this you cannot enter the uh, sinuses so in the next picture also you can see see this is the unsaid process and this is a dotted line that uh, that's been shown that how uh, with the help of a sickle uh, the unsaid process is removed now this is a short video that will just tell you that how uh, the unsaid process is removed uh, i think you can you can beautifully see the middle turbinate over here you can see the unsaid process over here also you can see the free edge of the unsaid process over here right so and you can you can see the maxillary line also so you can see till which area this unsaid uh, process is present so now you see this after after in uh, taking a nick the scalpel is uh or the sickle is moved towards the lateral wall and then 
through the same incision once it is the incision is taken down through the same incision the incision is extended superiorly okay right up to the axilla but it is the axilla is not broken uh, that way it's just left that way and see now now the thing that i was just trying to tell you see the mucosa bone and free, again there is a mucosa now this is one thing that actually i wanted to uh, tell you see this is a straight brachiosis that we are using once you have inside uh, uh, taken a nick on the uh, ancillary uh, process the you need to remove it with the help of a straight brachiosis now when you go and grab the ancillary process inferiorly where where it is attached uh, please keep in mind you uh, you you should not be you need to twist and remove the uh, ancillary process but while doing so inferiorly please see to it that you are not twisting your instrument clockwise because if you twist your instrument clockwise this is what starts happening is you start tearing the mucosa and then this oozing it starts trickling down so hence it is always said that when you grab it inferiorly inferiorly twist it anti clockwise and superiorly twist it clockwise you will you will see it this way see see now it it will, it will be grabbed okay at the base and when you do an anti clockwise movement you it it comes off inferiorly the place from where you want it and similarly once you go superiorly there we go okay it should be exactly the opposite way do clockwise so that the answer process comes out the place exact place where you want what you can see in front of you is a bullite modalis so as i said that unless and until you remove the ancillary process you cannot visualize the structures ahead that's the middle terminal is still intact over here right so removing the bulla is again a very uh, important part with the see you can you can you can do this surgery with very minimum instruments you can you take uh, make use of a straight blackesley which i usually do in my surgeries uh debriders yes if you do have you can definitely go ahead with it uh, but debriders uh, in my setup i can uh, we do not get such patients who are who can afford uh, uh, doing it under a debrider so uh, it's with the uh, main or age old fashioned instruments uh, is we remove all the structures present in the nose so removing a bulla is also very important um, you, you see a the bulla corner is over here okay the first thing that is done is always in 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 the entire face surgery please keep in mind avoid going laterally okay laterally and superiorly is the place which you have to avoid going stay as much possible as medially and inferiorly the more you stay medially and inferiorly the less chances of you encountering any important structures is there anyhow so when we go to remove the bulla in a similar fashion what is done you have to take a, a punch medially and inferiorly and we need to see whether there is a lumen present uh, or a hole present inside why you need to see a lumen because as i just mentioned a few minutes ago if the lamina papyracea is dehiscent this could be the orbital bulge also and so you it is always said that take a hearty punch and uh, me, uh, medially medial medially and inferiorly see if there is a lumen if you see a lumen then you can put your uh, uh, blackesley inside open up all the air cells and then remove the bulla entirely it always keep in mind when you remove the bulla remove it entirely don't remove it half way so in this uh, video also you'll be able to see as this was the bulla that i was i had just mentioned okay and this is the blackesley and now just see that there's a hearty bite which will be taken medially and inferiorly okay go in take a bite leave it see if there's a lumen inside okay you see there's a lumen inside and then start removing but when you remove as i said remove it entirely okay don't keep it half way okay so the entire bulla ethmodalis is removed what we come across now what is the structure that we see now this structure it is nothing but the ground lamella okay or the basal lamella so it this is that part of the middle turbinate that is going posteriorly and it is coming and attaching to the 
lateral wall. Hmm? Of course, uh, if the disease actually is limited only up to the anterior ethmoids, uh, you need not go and perforate the posterior ethmoids. As I just mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, whichever the pathological part is there, you are supposed to remove only that. Which the, the healthy parts are to be uh, left as it is. So it is not a rule that if you're doing a face surgery, you need you should be going and uh, removing all the structures or you need to explore up the spheroid. It's not a rule. Only the place up till where the disease is there, just go explore it, remove those disease uh, uh, pathological parts and you're good to go. So, uh, of course, now starting with the posterior ethmoidectomy. See, the posterior ethmoidectomy, again, it starts, as I said, with the perforation of the basal lamella. Okay, so this is the basal lamella that you can see, and we need to perforate this. Please understand one thing. The inferior part, now this is also called as a ground lamella. We are not supposed to disrupt this part. This has to remain as it is, because this is going to help stabilize the middle turbinate. And middle turbinate in the entire process, you are not, not supposed to fracture because middle, the middle turbinate is inserted to the cribriform plate. And uh, if you fracture it, there's a possibility of a CSF leak. So this has to remain intact. So even for that matter, the ground lamella should be intact. While uh, perforating the basal lamella, it is usually done that around two millimeters above the ground lamella usually this is the area where you start perforating. Perforation again is in the same manner. Go up, perforate, you will get to see it. Okay. Perforation again in the same manner. You go up, push in and open up. See if there's a lumen. You see a lumen and then after that, it becomes easier for you to remove the posterior it model air cells. Now this is a mushroom forceps that's been used. Mushroom forceps um, are good to use because, you know, it doesn't cause trauma to the structures which are present in front. It goes on cutting sideways. So you can cut from any place to the left, to the right, up, down, each and every place. You can uh, remove the structures present. Of course, the, uh, the mucosa which you see, mucosa uh, in this case has been stripped off just for anatomical uh, demonstration. In uh, normal individuals or in healthy individuals, the mucosa has to be uh, kept intact because you know it, it regrows. Uh, you, it has to again uh, create the nasal cavity properly. Nevertheless, <clears throat> so uh, once you uh, get to know that there are no important uh, structures over there, you go on removing uh, the posterior ethmoid uh, air cells up to which place? Up to the place where you reach the. Uh, sphenoid sinus. Okay. Now, of course, this again with the help of the mushroom force, the mucosa has been teared off. That should not be done. That should not be done in uh, normal patients. But for uh, anatomical demonstration, it is very necessary for uh, it, you to be knowing it. And once you remove it, you will come across the posterior ethmoidal artery, which will be visible. You see this. Okay. So the posterior ethmoidal artery. Okay. And this, sorry, yeah, this is the uh, sphenoid sinus where we, we are going to go, but that is the posterior ethmoidal artery. Okay. So once you reach now the uh, face of the sphenoid sinus, <clears throat> There are two ways by which you can explore the synod sinus. Uh, one, yes, you can try to explore it through its natural ostium by which uh, you need to lateralize the middle turbinate, uh, check where the superior turbinate is there and uh, on the level of the superior turbinate uh, over here, you will get to see the natural ostium of the synod sinus and explore the disease out from there. That is one way, which of course we do uh, in our routine line of surgery also. Or the second way is uh, you make use of a J-shaped curate in order to enter the sphenoid sinus. Now, rule again remains the same. You have to stay 
medially and inferiorly please avoid going superiorly and laterally because now you are entering an area where there are a few important structures okay so you can see this j-shaped curate and you can see see this is the posterior ethmoidal artery which is present and this is how you you please don't go here here you are near the orbit please don't go there so you need to go medially and inferiorly okay see that and just with a hard push you can enter the sphenoid sinus that is where the sphenoid sinus is present once you remove the curate you need to just go and see if there is a lumen again inside and if there's a lumen, in, lumen inside again similarly take down the entire wall and expose the sphenoid sinus now in cases of a uh, disease condition many a times see the uh, the anatomical structures as you can visualize uh, currently are you won't be able to see because the anatomy is disrupted right? but you should be knowing first the normal part in order to understand the abnormal part right so even in our medical science first we should know what is the physiology and then we can understand what the pathology is so similarly first you should know what the anatomy actually is and so after that you can understand what the pathological findings are there of course now while after after removing this uh, again this this is uh, the mucosa which should remain intact but that is removed for uh, demonstration purpose oops sorry just a sec just a sec let me just that is removed for demonstration purpose and let me just take it ahead yeah yeah hmm. See, this is the orbital apex. apex pressure you even the orbital nerve uh, it will get exposed but that is how close we are to the uh, orbital nerve okay uh, so while exploring spinner please see to it kindly don't go laterally you are going to encounter a lot of problems and down over here if you if you go to see you can see uh, the, the bleeding spots also over here so that's the carotid okay so you are near very important structures when you are uh, working in the sphenoid sinus so no matter what happens even if you are confident that yes you can go laterally or you can go superiorly please avoid doing that okay stay as possible medially and inferiorly and you will not encounter any major issues okay now uh, the second last obviously is the maxillary sinus uh, ostium uh, which uh, we need to explore now the Maxillary sinus, where is it present? This, if you go to see, will be the uncinate process line. Just posterior, let me just start. Okay. This is the uncinate process line. Just posteriorly, that is the bulla. Uh, and between that, you if you go to see, that's the infundibulum. So if you just go down over here, that is the horizontal part of the uncinate process, just above, uh, proximal to that remnant over there, there you will get to see the maxillary ostium okay and uh, of course down you will get to see over here now this is a backbiting backbiting forceps is used again to widen the maxillary uh, sinus ostium so that the ventilation you can create it properly hmm? now if you see down over here see this is the accessory ostium you see the accessory ostium no, is it's usually vertical but the natural ostium is usually oblique if you see over here, uh, see see how oblique it is present over here. You see that it's obliquely present, but the accessory ostium, accessory ostium is a, is an extra ostium. It is not the natural ostium. It is not natural opening of the maxillary sinus. So many a times for you to understand whether this opening, whether it's the natural ostium or not, please understand the natural ostium is always tilted and the accessory ostium is always perpendicular straight. Okay, that will help you define. Uh, which is the maxillary ostium and which which is the natural ostium and which is not the natural ostium. <clears throat> now the final work is done with at the frontal sinus. Why this is kept at the end? This is kept because uh, if you start exploring the frontal sinus in the beginning only, uh, the uh, bleeding or oozing will start occurring and that will create a, a hindrance in your surgery. So it is always said that uh, frontal sinus exploration should be kept at the end. 
This exposition is usually done with the help of a 45 degree or a 70 degree uh, endoscope. And uh, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago that it, we cannot enter the frontal sinus. It's not possible for us to see the frontal sinus. What we do is we just try to open the drainage system. We try to see to it that uh, the frontal recess is open so that frontal sinus starts draining properly into the uh, middle meters. Now that typically is done, see the, this obstruction usually is caused because of the agar nether cells. And I think I have shown you a few moments ago that how it is situated in between, which causes uh, obstruction to the flow of the frontal sinus. So uh, the, the main important part is that you need to break the agar nether cells so that the drainage starts uh, happening. But one thing uh, you should know that these agar nether cells have got its uh, connections with the orbit. It has got its connection with the nasolacrimal duct. And hence, while breaking it, it is uh, you have to be very, very, very careful. You have to break it posteriorly and superiorly only. Okay, please understand that. Do not go laterally. Go posteriorly and superiorly and try to just break it open so that the drainage to the frontal sinus is achieved properly. So once the entire disease is removed from the nasal cavity, later on, of course, the nasal nose is packed with the help of uh, gel, uh, ab gel, or uh, we, uh, we usually uh, uh, see to it that this, whatever uh, uh, ab gel that we put inside the nose, it is kept for minimum 48 hours. And after that, uh, it is removed and the patient is told to do nasal douching because see so much after do, removing so much of tissue, there are going to be scabs. There's going to be a scab formation present in the nasal cavity and that is again going to cause obstruction. So nasal douching is necessary for uh, the patient so that all the material which is collected in the nasal cavity, it is flushed out. What are the complications? Bleeding, obviously, as I just said, that if you encounter enterythmodal artery, it's going to bleed like anything. Sinic formation, uh, very common. Uh, Sinic formation is, is, is extremely commonly seen. Orbital injury, as I just said, diplopia, orbital hematoma, blindness, CSF leak, yes, possible because if you, uh, anyway, you become very harsh with the middle turbinate, CS, there's a high amount of chance of CSF leak. Direct brain injury, obviously, because you're near the skull base. So there's a number of chances that you might injure the uh, skull base also. And nasolacrimal duct injury, Yes, because it is also in proximal uh, proximity of the uh, anatomical parts that we are working on. So, what is to conclude? Okay, uh, it is very simple. See, FES is, is a very simple surgery. Uh, you should know where not to go. That is the key point. Please understand that. If you know where you are not supposed to go, then this surgery becomes very easy. If you don't know where you are not supposed to go, then you are going to encounter a lot of problems. Right? So, keep this thing in your mind. And the following structures, again, the onset process, maxillary sinus ostium, bulla ethmodalis, lamina paparicia, ethmodal arteries, ground lamella, frontal sinus, uh, spinal sinus, and the frontal sinus. Again, a take-home message is minimum trauma, okay, will lead to minimum injury, which in turn will uh, help in better outcome of the surgery. Now, this is a small video of an AC polyp that was being done. Uh, now, you see, I was not being able to visualize the axilla. I told you the first thing you need to see is the axilla. And see, there I could see the axilla. So, unless and until you see the axilla, you should not be proceeding ahead. Then it was the infiltration that was done to the axilla. And what I was doing over here, see, I was not being able to visualize uh, any structures uh, in and around because the polyp was way too big. So, uh, with the help of a gauze, I was just trying to, you know, dissect. See, the uh, maxillary, uh, the, the anterocolor polyp is coming out through the maxillary sinus. So, I was just dissecting the connection of the polyp from where it is arising from the maxillary sinus. And by that, the polyp will become mobile and we can remove it. Okay. Now, you see, uh, once while doing so, see all the pus coming out. You see that? And once this pus came out, the polyp, polyp size started shrinking okay, because of the sinus was completely filled up. You see the middle terminate. Look at the middle terminate. Okay. And then suddenly after removing this, see the polyp has been taken out. And once uh, you remove the entire polyp, it will be taken out from the, see that the, the maxillary or the EC polyp has got its extension into the cona also. 
right so it's a trifoliate uh, uh, this thing so the maxillary part the nasal part and the posterior coronal part everything has to be removed okay so once that entire thing uh, was removed see here it will be now taken out okay grab posteriorly as far as possible and then it was removed okay and once this thing was done see how roomy the cavity became uh, and the last thing that needed to be done was to open the maxillary ostia and that was done with the help of a backbiting forceps you see this is the ancillary process okay so it is just near the horizontal part of the ancillary process that that part was removed of course uh, some part of the ancillary was also removed during the process okay just to ventilate and this is how the alveolar nasal pack was placed inside okay it was placed totally and as i said that this pack usually is removed after 48 hours okay now this is another video this video actually is a self explanatory video when you can see the polyp <laughs> now this this was a video which i think i had i had posted on my uh, department's facebook page uh, wherein uh, it becomes very easier for anybody who watches this video to understand uh, the anatomical variations uh, now of course this is the turbinate over here and the nostril was packed with 4% xylocaine as i said that this is the first thing that we do that you have to uh, pack the nostril the septum was so much deviated it was becoming very difficult for me to maneuver also and see the pack if you see it's been pushed inside the middle meatus please see to it see this is very necessary because that is the area that you are going to work on so uh, anesthesia should be at in that area see how how you can see the blanching at the axillary area okay this what was i was doing i was just out fracturing it because I, it was not being possible for me to visualize any structures so this was out fracturing again axilla of the uh, second part which which has been infiltrated see how it is blanching beautifully okay and once that is then part of the middle turbinate also that is also usually infiltrated okay and now you can see 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 how you can see the ancillary process look at it look at the free end see look at the free end of the ancillary process this is what you need to understand where it is and that's the bulla over there okay and now with the help of a sickle again you have to remove the ancillary process in a similar fashion see you go down the sickle is retracted again put in the same area and we go superiorly seeing to it that we are not breaking through and then with the help of a blackesley the uh, ancillary process is removed okay and now it's the bulla you see i'm just punching and i'm seeing if there's a lumen i could see the lumen and now i am going inside and i am removing the entire bulla it model is out you see the same process you twist it and you remove it. don't pull never pull out anything every time you have to have to uh, twist uh, and remove it okay so once the disease it was uh, the sphenoid was not involved so the sphenoid exploration was not done on this side but the uh, other side yes the sphenoid was involved uh but see it was a deviated part so it was making things very difficult for uh, anybody of us to even visualize but then what usually is done is if you cannot visualize now the polypodal parts which are there they are firstly try we, we we remove them in order uh that for us to visualize the anatomical structures okay and once you remove it then there's a big area so you can see all the structures present and uh, see that is how again the ancillary has been removed you see that okay and we re remove the scalpel sickle again we go through the same incision we go up there we go okay and again this part is again removed okay this part is again removed superiorly and inferiorly it is removed the main thing was that uh, on this side of the nostril the polyps were present in the uh, sphenoid sinus as well okay but over here as i just mentioned a few uh, minutes ago that uh, now of course the bulla has been resected right now uh, as i just uh, uh, mentioned a few minutes ago that uh, 
uh, exploring the Swinard sinus, there are two ways. One is the way that it was being shown in the dissection. And uh, the second way is obviously the way that I am uh, I have removed the polyps from the current uh, case. See, the sinus uh, ostium was widened entirely. And whenever there's a disease uh, area, now please understand, it bleeds. Oozing is very high uh, whenever there's a disease uh, sinus present. So uh, we usually give, you know, steroids so that we try to see to it that uh, the oozing, you know, it remains under control. See, this is how I'm going. You see, you see that polyp. It's coming through the sinus. sinus. Okay, so I have entering through the natural ostium of the sinus sinus. And from there, I uh, have avulsed and removed the polyp, which was arising from the sphenoid sinus. There, that's the sphenoid sinus. Beautiful, you can see. Okay. And of course, you see the, the polypodal mucosa, all edematous polypodal mucosa. So, you know, you usually give a nice uh, course of steroid. Once you give a nice course of steroid, the, the uh, intra of bleeding also comes under com control. Okay, and it helps to regress the uh, polyps also. That's the spinal sinus out over there. Okay, perfect. I think uh, that that is what the main thing is that you should not see this. Uh, even even the turbinate is intact. There is no problem with the turbinate also. The turbinate is intact, which is very 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 necessary. Okay, and the recess is again explored further to see if there is any underlying disease present. And once See, that's the superior turbinate over there. Okay. And once this entire thing, see that superior turbinate over there. Okay. And once this was done, then again, the nose was packed with abgel. And again, as I said, the same rule applies. Uh, remove the pack after 48 hours, not before that. During this period, of course, the patient does have epiphora. The patient does complain of sinusitis or headache continuously because the passage uh, is blocked. So once you remove uh, this package, uh, then uh, the highway again uh, becomes open. So that is how it was. It is back. So I hope I hope everybody have uh, got a some glimpse of how uh, uh, we do work with uh, the sinus surgeries. Uh, I usually encourage that before going for surgeries, please do a cadaver dissection. These dissections you can do in your uh, own institute also. Uh, see, uh, you don't need a camera. All you need is a zero degree endoscope and you need a, a Blakesley's uh, instruments. A straight Blakesley will also help you to identify all the structures, identify them, explore them, get a feel. Once you get a feel of the uh, all, all the in, uh, structures present in the nose, uh, it will become easier for you to work on it. Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you one and all for your patience. Listening. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Srinasa, sir. Uh, now I would uh, like to request Dr. Chandana Virkan, madam, to share her uh, view about this session. Ma'am? Yeah. Good afternoon. Hope I am audible. Yes, yes, yes ma'am. Ma yes, yes, madam. Yeah. First and foremost, I would like to thank organizers for giving me opportunity to share this interesting session. I appreciate and congratulate uh, Team Shalakya of LRP Ayurved Medical College Islampur for hosting su successfully this uh, national webinar. Okay, and now about this session, Dr. Mayur Shirayakar, distinguished speaker of this session, uh, he delivered insightful talk about face. He covered A to Z about uh, face, right from history of face, applied anatomy, uh, various techniques and instruments for face, possible complications, where not to go, and everything, everything about face. Dr. Shirakar shared his valuable practical experiences and tips about uh, uh, the surgical technique, which made this uh, lecture more interesting. And uh, presentation was also visually stunning with nice videos. Uh, as usual, 
Dr. Shirayakar uh, must have motivated and inspired many PG students toward ENT practice and uh, especially uh, mastering endoscopy technique. Okay, yeah. thank you. So much. Nice presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma Virkar, ma'am, uh, is my uh, teacher, my guide. So it feels, you know, always it feels nice when uh, your teacher appreciates you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now I request, now I request Dr. Sunil Vainika, sir, to form vote of thanks for this session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayur Shirakar, sir, for your valuable lecture and which will be definitely informative for our PG students. Thank you. Thank you once again. Uh, now we are in the last phase of session on behalf of Ayurved Medical College Islampur, I take the privilege of proposing a vote of thanks. First of all, my sincere thanks to our chief uh, speakers and chairpersons for accepting our invitation and de delivering such a interesting topics and informative speech to us. Next, my sincere thanks to our founder of Institute, Dr. Uh, uh, founder of Institute Sri Nishikant Gosle Patil Dada. Then our Dean Sir, uh, Dr. Virendra Minkere Sir, and Director of Prakash Shikshan Mandal, Mr. Sandeep Yadav Sir, PG Director, Dr. Pramod Kalab Sir, PhD Director, Dr. Ajit Patil Sir. Next, my uh, thanks to our HOD Dr. Praveen Zawan sir and all organizing coordinators, Dr. Nita Patil madam, Dr. Dage madam, Dr. Bapad madam for their support and cooperation. Thanks to IT department, non-teaching staff and our delegates for active participation. Now my humble request is that kindly fill the feedback form given in the YouTube chat box to get certificate, those, uh, those who have registered for this webinar, only they will get the certificate who were registered. Please uh, notice that. If anybody having any issues regarding feedback form or any submission, please contact with us, this team. Hmm? And thank you. Thank you all. Then this meeting is over. Thank you. Thank you.